So we just saw an example of conditional probability, and now we're ready for independence. So let's make some space here. Independence. Independence is a fantastically useful property to have. When it, whenever you've got independence, then life is good. So what is it? I'm going to give you three definitions. Of their not equivalent definitions, but they are definitions of independence in different types of contexts. So the first one, definition. This is the independence between two events. So we say that events A and B are independent if the probability of their intersection equals the product of the probabilities. That's it. That's independence for two events. So let's think about what this means. Well, intuitively, you can think about independence as saying that these two events are unrelated or they're not dependent on one another. Now, sometimes, you know, so, so for example, an example would be, you know, like if I had a coin and I, and I flip the coin and I get maybe heads or tails and then I flip, flip the coin again. So maybe the outcome of the first event is head is the is A. I call that event A, and the outcome of the second flip I call B. And typically you would consider these to be independent events because the outcome of the first flip shouldn't affect the outcome of the second. And like in our example with the the dice here, maybe you would consider the out like we did here. We consider the outcome of this roll the, the roll of this die to be independent of the outcome of the roll of this die. So let's draw a picture of what independence looks like. So if I have my, let's say omega is like a, a square here from, this is a unit square from 0 to 1 on this axis, axis and 0 to 1 on this axis. And this is my omega. And now I'm going to take a random variable, uh, or rather an, an event, A. Let's call A this left half. So A is going to be left half here of my omega. So that's A. And B, let's take B to be the top half. So that's my B. Now, let's say this is a one half here and one half here. So these, these split the space into half. And what's important is that if I put a uniform probability measure on this, this square, then the probability of the set A, of the event A, is just going to be a half. The probability of, of B is going to be a half. And the probability of the intersection is this upper corner, which has probability one quarter. And therefore, this property is satisfied. So that means that these events would be independent. Now, it's not. Uh, particularly important here that I happen to draw them to be the upper half and the lower half. They could be all uh, funny, funny shapes. They, they could be skewed, all bent around. What's important is that the amount of o oh, is the the overlap, the probability of the overlap of the intersection, and the probabilities of the individual events. So that's independence of two events. Now let's look at independence for multiple events. So if we have some finite set of events, A1 through AN, we say that they are independent or sometimes you say mutually independent if, so that's what we're defining, mutually independent if for any subset S contained in the set of indices, these 1 through N are the indices, for any set, any subset like that, we have that. 
the probability of the intersection of the sets with the indices in that, or rather the, the events with indices in S. So it's the intersection of some subset of these events equals the product of the probabilities. So a special case would be, for example, all of them. So that you know the the probability of the intersection of all of them equals the product of the probabilities. Or I could pick any two, say a1 and a2, and then I would have independence uh, that looked something like this. So this, in particular, implies. So note. This implies mutual independence implies pairwise independence. In other words, any pair of these are independent. However, warning, danger, the converse is not true. Pairwise independence does not imply mutual independence. And we'll see an example of that uh, a little later. So what's the picture for mutual independence? Well here it is. I'm going to try to draw mutual independence for you. Test my drawing skills. So we're going to take again a square, 0 to 1, And this time, so I'm going to start out a little similarly. So I'm going to take A. This is my A again. The left half. Or rather, that's going to be A1. So I'm going to do the case of N equals 3. So it's going to be my A1. Maybe put 1 there. Now, my A2, I'm going to take to be the leftmost quarter. And this kind of third quarter. So that's my A2. It's the union of these. That's two. And three is going to be the left halves of each of the remaining parts. or each of the, the parts that I divided this up into. So, 1 and 2 are independent. You can, so this was like a half here, this is a quarter, this is an eighth, and so on. So A1 and A2 were independent by similar reasoning as before, and you can check that A1 and A3 are also independent. Maybe you can sort of see that because they, the amount they overlap by is that these are the overlapping parts, which is just half. And uh, A2 and A3 are also independent. So these are mutually. Oh, so that well, that was pairwise independence. And in addition, the product of all of the pro the probability of the intersection of all three of them equals the product of the probabilities of all three, because what's the intersection of all three of them? Well, that's just this left hand eighth, and that has probability, one eighth, and the, probab the probability of each of them uh, separately is one half. So one half times one half times one half is one eighth. So this is a picture, so you could, you could think about continuing this, splitting these up and, and going further, and you can get a, any number of mutually independent events. So that's mutual independence. And the third type of independence we're going to consider is conditional independence. So A and B are conditionally Conditionally independent given C 
if I'll leave that for you if the probability of A intersect B given C equals the probability of A given C times the probability of B given C. So what does this mean? So you can think of intuitively at least if I know that C happened then I restrict my attention to the event C and A and B are just independent. But uh, let me draw a picture here to make clear what I mean. So say I've got say this is a, a rectangle 0 to 1 2 and 0 to 1 in this direction and now I take a similar picture as for independence so I'll take say my A is going to be this part and my B say the upper half of the this square and C I'll take to be the whole thing. So C will just be this whole rectangle. Now, so this was C. Oh, sorry, that's not supposed to be C. C I want to be just this first square. So omega is the whole rectangle and let's say I put a uniform measure on here uniform probability measure then when I restrict my attention to C so if I looked at the intersection of A, B, and C and I looked at the fraction of A and B the intersection in C we can see that that's just one quarter like it was in our example for just two to two events and when I look at the fraction I'm considering a uniform measure if I look at the fraction of of uh, C that consists of a then that's just a half and if I look at the fraction of C that consists of B that's a half so so that means that the fraction of C that consists of this intersection equals the product of the other two and that's exactly what this is saying so A and B here are conditionally independent given C. But you can check, if you'd like, that if I had the uniform measure here, then A and B are not independent. They're only uh, conditionally independent given C. So in other words, uh, independence or, or mutual independence does not imply conditional independence in general. So these are a few definitions of different types of independence and next we're gonna take a, uh, a look at an, a, an example of that will illustrate all three of these nicely.